Hey, John here. Welcome to the second half of a discussion on how to perform IP interprocess communications using the Berkeley Socket API, as discussed in this document here, which is Programmer Supplementary Documents, Chapter 20 in the BSD44 Lite Software Distribution. You can find links to this below this video in the description on YouTube if you're interested in reading more. All right, this is the client software example that I ported to run on Linux. There's some cosmetic differences in minor header file uh, changes in order to make it run. I discussed that in part one. Now, in this section, what we're going to do is we're going to bring this thing up to date a little bit. We're not going to use get host by name anymore. We're going to use inet p to n, which is a newer version of this type of function that solves some problems. Uh, namely, it gets rid of this need to do the binary copy here, and it also will allow you, if you would like, to use IP6 addresses instead of just IP4, where get host by name will only work with IP4 addresses. Now, one of the benefits of get host by name, by the way, is this will also do name uh, lookups to convert host names, like if you type in www.google.com, in this argv1 field here, it would actually use the domain name service system to figure out its IP number, translate it, and then return that based on the name rather than just the IP. All right, so this is still valuable to some degree, but if you're just going to type in an IP number in this day and age, you want to use INET P to N. So here's a program where I started making some modifications. Up here we see all the same thing, the same data that we send over to the server, and the differences are shown in these if def uh, statements right here. So rather than using get host by name down here, I'm going to call this function here inet p to n. This is new. It's not going to be in the Berkeley documentation. In here I can either say af inet or if I'd like I could type af inet 6, and I can go either way. So I'm going to take the argument here which must then be an IP4 address. This will not use the name server, okay? You have to type in what we call a dotted quad, right? The four numbers with the three dots between them. This function will simply convert the string value here directly into a IP4 address and then write it directly into the sin adder field here of the server socket or IN structure, okay? So we don't have to have this extra B copy down here like we did with get host by name. Another benefit of this is it's reentrant, or get host by name uses an internal object in the subroutine and then returns a pointer to its internal object. Okay, so if you have a multi-threaded program and both threads, uh, you know, two or three, two or more threads call uh, get host by name at the same time, it won't work correctly. Okay, on the other hand, this will. And this is the server that I ported to run on Linux by making similar cosmetic changes to the code so that it is brought up to date. And we discussed this in part one. And just like I updated the client, let's upgrade the server a little bit. Now remember before when we did the uh, get sock name on the server to find out what port was assigned to the server because up here we used a wildcard. We said we don't care what address we get and by setting the port number to listen on to zero, we're saying we don't care. So down here we can use get sock name and we can ask, well, what is our address? And I reuse this server variable here because it's no longer needed once we've used it up in the bind here, okay? And we uh, gave it the length of the socket or IN structure because we set it up here. And when get sock name returns, it can modify that variable. So this thing ends up uh, requiring a pointer to the length of the sock adder field, all right, rather than the length itself. Now you can see up here, this is commented out. If you want to set a specific port number for your server, like say, I'll, I want to listen on port 9965. So when the client connects, it has to connect to 9965, as opposed to 
What we saw last time was, well, every single time you start up the server, it listens on a random port, and of course, it printed it out down here so we could know what it is. Okay, When we ran our client, we'd have to type that number in. By me setting this just to 9965, it'll always bind on to 9965, so I don't have to look it up and type in the number every single time. Right. So normally, when you write a server, this is what you do it will listen on a specific address and you prearrange that usually in this case i'm going to just hard code it in here uh sometimes you might give it a command line argument all right now what else did i change in here well rather than just calling accept and using null for these second two arguments you can see with this if one up here i'm replacing that one line of code with these three lines of code i'm going to put a uh, i'm going to define another socket adder i n i'm calling it from and I'm going to create another length, another sock, ad, sock len t, set it to this number of bytes in here, and I'm going to pass those variables down as arguments to my accept. And what this is going to do now is when accept returns as a client uh, is connected a uh, new socket, the accept call is going to give me the sock adder of what we call the peer of the connection. This will tell me the IP number and the port of the machine that the client application is running on that opened the connection. Okay, And you pass this in just like you did with the, uh, with the get sock name above here, right? where you had to pass the pointer to the length and the pointer to the sock adder IN. Same thing down here. Okay. Once I have this sock adder, and the accept is returned, and we know we didn't get an error, I can call INET n to p okay that stands for number to presentation all right so the from remember is the variable it's a sock adder okay i can send the fields from inside that sock adder into this function rather than sending the sock adder as a whole with the casting and all that foolishness like we do up here we can send the individual fields and this will then work a little bit better all right so if i type n to p and i give it the family because it needs to know what kind of sock adder it is otherwise it just has no clue all right but when i do the accept the accept fills in the address family right it's going to say it's you know afi net and i'm going to give it the address of the internet address field member in the from object okay i'm going to then give it the address of a, of a character array the buffer same buffer i'm going to use down here it's got 1024 bytes in it more than enough to hold the name of the host and and it wants to know how many bytes there are in there so that it doesn't overwrite it overwrite too many uh bytes in there and we're sure that that's going to be big enough at uh 1k when that's all done, I'm going to use the uh, use printf, or you could put a you know you could use a C plus plus, you know C out double f you know whatever. Uh, the uh, this is you know the printf style with the template of the output in here and the variables that be printed and substituted in these percent s and percent d values. Specifically, the buffer that will hold the printable version of the IP number, so we can see it. And because the port is stored in network byte order, which is big endian, we have to flip it around to little endian. Otherwise, it'll be interpreted incorrectly when it is printed out, and we'll see the wrong value. So let's compile up these two uh, uh, applications here and see how they run. All right, so I have these two windows in the same directory, so I can type in what? I'll run the server here. Server, if I can spell correctly, two. And the server needs no arguments at all. It uh, starts running, and it'll print out the port. And because I set it, I hard-coded it to 9965, it's, re it's nice to know <laughs> that that's where it's uh, listening, okay? Then I can run the client. I can connect it back to the local host. And I need to connect it to this port number right here for it to send its data. And of course, it works fine. This time, printing this message here that it accepted a connection from 127.0.0.1 on port 58578. So this is the port that the client used because remember the client application uses a wildcard to say i don't care what address you give me i don't care what port 
you want me to use for the client end uh, uh, socket of that stream connection, okay? As long as the client's connecting to a server that's on this IP number and this address, okay? So every time we run it, you'll see the client actually gets a different, uh, somewhat randomish looking port number. Now, as I also said before, we can look at the IP addresses on my machine. Now, we've been using this loopback address here. But my machine also has this address down here. If I want to, I can actually use my hardwired Ethernet address if I, if I feel like it. Okay? Now, there's pros and cons to using one of these versus the other. Uh, where are we listening on? We're on 99.65. If I use this number, it'll turn out that the client side address and port will have to match. Because if I connect to a server on this address, the server has to be able to get back to the client, and they'll both end up using this other physical interface. Okay? Now, exactly why that is and all the subtle details is a subject of like an entire different class in networking, okay? So I'm not going to get into that, but rest assured, this in the simple case, the reason I showed it to you is it proves that my machine knows itself by more than one address. It knows it by its loopback name, and it knows it by its, let's call this its public name, all right? Now, as exciting as it is to clean up some of the cosmetic things, bring it up to date a little bit, there is a bigger problem with this code. And that is that, as I said before, sometimes when you're writing some data, let's go back down here and see what the code looks like. Sometimes if you're going to just call write, you'll notice I changed it to safe underscore write down here. Sometimes when you use the right system call, it doesn't always send the entire amount of data for the number of bytes that you specify in here, because that's not the job of the right system call. If you read the documentation in here, it clearly states that it writes up to count number of bytes from this buffer here, starting at, you know, the beginning, to the file referred to by the file descriptor FD over here. Okay, specifically, it might actually be right less than what you want. Okay, and there's various reasons why that is. Okay, that's not our immediate concern right now. The fact of the matter is, it might not send them all. Therefore, when I write my data out, I usually write a function that looks like this to make sure that it all gets sent. So let's look and see what I did there. Now my doc for this is that it's the same as the write function, but I add a loop to make sure that it completes any partially written data. All right. Now here's how this thing works. If I call write and I give it the buffer and the length, and it decides oh, I'm going to write, maybe I want to, uh, you know, write a hundred bytes or something when I call safe write. But write down here only wants to write out ten bytes right now. Okay. What it will do is it'll write the first ten bytes of this buffer out even if the length was 100. It will then return a value over here that says 10, letting me know that while I asked for 100, it only wrote 10. Now, if it's writing to the uh, socket and there's some sort of an error, you know, like the server crashed and the socket closed, I'll get an error of some kind, and then this will end up returning a negative one over here, okay? But if it doesn't fail, It'll come down here, and you can see I'm printing out, I, I sent this many bytes. Then what do I do? I'm going to say, all right, tally up the number of bytes that the right function says it sent. In this scenario, it's, we're assuming that I asked for 100, but it only wrote 10. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract that 10 from the total number of bytes I want to still send. Now, you don't want to send the same 10 over and over again, so you can clearly see I need to move the buffer pointer into this character array here, however many bytes that were written on the first time around this loop. Okay? So I'm going to leapfrog up and say, well, here's where the rest of the data begins. 
by adding however many bytes were written in the first call. And I'm going to reduce the total number that are left, because obviously if I wrote 10 out of 100, I only want to finish it up with 90. We hit the bottom of this while loop that's set to say, while well, the length is greater than zero. So this could run around and around and around quite a while if it's sending like one byte at a time, okay? So when it finally gets done and the loop ends down here, I'm going to simply return len, which at this point would be zero. And yeah, I admit this probably is not exactly compatible with the right system call because it should have returned the number of bytes that it actually wrote in its entirety. I'll leave that as a task for the uh, viewer to change in their version of this code if they should want to. But it turns out that safe right here will either return negative one if there's an error or zero if it worked correctly, all right? And if it worked correctly, the amount of data it wrote is what it was told, okay? So it almost doesn't matter that I kind of meh, wrote a non-portable version of this thing, okay? Now, as you can see down here, I call it like I would the regular old write function, and I ask, you know, is the value that it returns less than zero? If it's so, the error no, variable will still be set from the right call that was in the subroutine. So I can go ahead and, and treat it like the error that I did before in any old right call. Now, along with all this, notice that I also changed the amount of data that I'm sending here. In the original versions, there was a macro that simply had this string in there. In this version, I have a const expr that uh, defines a, a data array of characters that has a copy of the Berkeley license in it. It was just handy text for me to paste in there. And by the way, if you've never seen this notation, if you have a, a quoted string like this, followed you know, immediately by another quoted string, what that means to the C compiler is that this whole thing, these two text strings are to be catenated together into one big one. So all these combined are one single giant string, which is the initializer for this variable here. And it looks to me like I, I'm a little redundant. With a const expert const care, I think this const is a little redundant. But the compiler tolerates it. I'm going to leave it alone for now. All right. So what are the differences here? I got a const expert with a giant amount of data to send. Okay. And when I send it, I use this safe write function instead of the regular old write function. And it will enter a loop repeatedly calling write if write decides that it can't write the whole thing in one call. Now, let's look at our third version of the server code. In here, I made one small change. I removed the if defs and stuff that we saw in the last example, and I changed this around down here. Well, first of all, I changed it to using a C version of a print statement instead of this, okay? Because when I print out what I've read, I want to know how many bytes were read, okay? So it's going to say a bunch of dashes. It'll say read, and then it'll say the return value from read, which is the number of bytes that were read, okay? And then I'm going to put these greater than signs. I'm going to print that message out, and then I'm going to put some less than signs on the line, all right? And I'm going to do this because if I was to send from a client some message that ends with a bunch of spaces, I won't be able to tell if I print it out this way. It'll just be some characters and any spaces over here to the right. If I actually print it out, if, I, if the client sent a message that was this actual print source code here, blah, 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 with a semicolon here, with a bunch of spaces after it, it would still just print out the statement here looking like it ends with a semicolon i won't be able to tell their spaces over here but by putting these after it i will be able to see you know the triple less than signs way over here if there's a bunch of blanks in there so i can be really sure what i really got from the client it's at least a little bit better okay and let's compile those up and let's run them okay last time we ran server two let's run server three this time again we got our 9965 Here's our client. Uh, let's run client three. Now, when we run client three, it says that it sent 1765 bytes because the uh, write routine, every time it goes around the loop, 
we'll look back again to review in a second, every time it calls right and tries to send out the big chunk of data that it's sending, it's going to print out how much any individual write call sent. So in this case, what happened was the safe write subroutine, the first time through that loop, it tried to print 1765 bytes and the whole lot of it went out, okay, in one write call. Let's look and see what happened up here in the server. When I started up server number three, it listened on 9965. It accepted a connection back from the public IP number on this random port over here, what we call an ephemeral port, by the way. The ports that are assigned that are wild carded, you know, the temporary ones. They're called ephemeral ports, okay? And they usually have pretty big numbers, like over 50,000, that kind of thing. Now, you can see the new print routine in the bottom of server 3 saying that it read 1024 bytes. And remember, in the original Berkeley code, every time it threw, went through that loop, it did a B0 to zero out the array. And then it read in up to 1024 bytes. So what, what it got was as much as it could read, right? It said, I want to read up to 1024. This client over here sent 1765, which is the whole copyright message. But because they only asked for 1024, that's what I got. Triple greater than, and then here is the copyright message, all right? And we'll look back at the source again of the, of the client, and you'll see that they all start with a space on the left when it sends it over. So we come along, we see the thing, and then it gets to this soft wuh. All right, and that's the end of the first part, and we see some garbage down here, and we'll see why that is there in a minute. So the server then goes around to the top of the loop to go read more. It then gets another 741 bytes, which start, starts with R, okay? That's S-O-F-T-W, A-R-E is provided by blah, 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 right? And then down here is the end of the copyright message, which ends with a carriage return after this period, which is why these are unaligned by itself. At that point, the client closes the socket. The server sees that as an end of file indication because in its read loop, what happens is It receives zero bytes when it calls read here if and when the socket has been closed by the peer, by the client, okay? Now, you can see some commented out code in here that I'm going to play around with. Because I have, now remember, how big is the, the buffer in there? It's up here at the top. Care buff 1024, right? So down here, as I talked about before, they decide to brilliantly zero out the entire buffer, which is going to be the 1024 bytes, followed by reading into that buffer up to 1024 bytes. And when we just ran it a minute ago, the first time through this loop, it came down here and it said it read 1024 bytes. So what does that really mean? It means that this all the zeros that were put into the 1024 elements of buff here, all of those elements were replaced when the read function filled in the buffer with 1024 bytes because that's what we asked for. So this code is just defective. This is why code has viruses. It's one of the biggest problems with code, this so-called off by one error. Because I'm printing out a C array of characters, Okay, that array absolutely, positively must end with a null character or the C out insertion operator or the printf. Both of these will have the same problem. It won't know when it's done. So if it actually gets all 1024 bytes, even though there were zeros in all of them before, they're all being replaced with printable characters. And whatever comes after the buffer in the memory of the machine is whatever's in the machine. So if you were to run this server and you ask for 1024, it's going to then come down here and print all those 1024, and it's going to keep on going. If what follows it happens to be data bytes that don't have any zero values in them, They'll be printed too, is the point, okay? So this code was originally broken as designed, all right? 
Now, before I compile this, let's run this one more time. Let's fire up server three, pipe it into hex dump, minus big C, and we can then watch what all these bytes are, not only just in printable, but we can actually see the hex values of them, all right? We'll rerun the client, and because the server always binds now to 9965, I don't have to look that up and type it in. Now, let's go ahead and kill the server up here and scroll back. Now we're looking at the hex dump of the output. So if we go back up here, we can see it printing the entire message, and we see it saying, hi, I got my 1024 bytes. It's got the triple greater than followed by a space, copyright, blah, 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 right? So the triple greater thans are these three E's right here. The two zero in hex is a space, right? So it starts out fine. We get to the end down here. It's really easy to see the triple less thans. When we, here they are. Uh, here's the triple less thans that we print after we're done with the data. And it says this SOFTW. It should stop there, in my opinion, right? Because it says this soft W A R E, this software is provided, blah, 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 blah. But it's written in two pieces. So what is this garbage here, right? Well, if you look at the triple less than signs, that's the three, three C's right here, okay? And we see one, two, three, four, five, six characters of junk right there. One, two, three, four, five, six, okay? Oh, it looks like there's a P there, and because five zero happens to be a capital P, and five six happens to be a capital V, right? But we know that's not in the message because the message says this software, and so on. So this stuff is garbage that gets printed out, and it gets printed out because it just so happens to be in the memory of the machine following the buffer that we're using for our read call. So let's fix this annoying problem. So how do we do that? Well, we have two options. One is to come down here, like I just did, and comment this out, not read in 1024, but instead use 1023, okay? So let's go ahead and compile this and run the new server three instead of the one we just did, which is the old one, all right? So we can run it exactly again with hex dump, and we'll run the client again. And we know that we're still going to be listening on 9965. And we'll run this one. Let's go ahead and kill the server and scroll back and see in the hex dump. Now we see SOFT and the triple less than signs are perfect. They're right on there. The 54 is the T, okay? And then we come on down and the greater than signs and the where is provided by blah, 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 blah. And the reason that works is... In this case, it's still wasteful and inefficient. We're zeroing out the entire buffer, and we're reading 1023 instead of all of the bytes that we could fit in this buffer. Therefore, we know that the very last byte of this character array here will have been set to zero up here so that no matter what I get when I read, It'll always have at least one null character at the end of the data. So it won't confuse any printing that takes place down here. Now, as I said before, there's a much better way to do this, a far more efficient, reasonable way to do this. Don't be zero it out at all. Read in one less than the total number of bytes that this array has in it, okay? And down here, if and only if you're going to print it out, is the only time you even care about this null terminator, right? Okay, because, I mean, we don't care in any other case. The only reason we need the null there is so we can print it out like this. If I was going to write some other code and process the data in some other way, I wouldn't even care about adding this null terminator. Like if I wanted to add up all those bytes or use them in some other way where the length is explicitly based on the value of bytes read from this socket here, then I would not have to do this. That's my point, right? So here's an alterminating character. I showed this in part one as an optimization. Why zero out a thousand bytes every time you go around this loop when all you really need to do is set one single byte to zero? Okay, which is the one that comes at the end of the message that you've read in. You have to always make sure you've left room 
to, for that extra byte, okay? We know that no matter what, our val, the most, the largest value it could ever be, is this size here, because that's the maximum length for the read call. And we know, because we looked at it before, that this buff here is actually set to 1024, okay? Now, if this was my code, I wouldn't use that number anyway, literally like that. I would do this, I would say size of buff minus one. Now, if you go up to the top of the code and change the size of your buffer variable to some bigger value or a smaller one, this will always work just fine, okay? As long as there's at least one byte in there, which is f stupid small, because if there's one, you will read zero, and then you're pro it would just break the whole program. But my point is, if for any size greater than one, this will now just automatically self-tune itself and run fine. This is the way this thing, in my opinion, should have been written from the get-go. So let's go ahead and compile that one and run it again, make sure it all still works. We don't really need the hex dump anymore. Okay, let's run server three, let's run client three, and we'll see that it ran, it finished, and it will terminate correctly up here, soft with the less than signs there, where, over here, and so on. All right, so this comes out correctly as we would expect it to. And we don't have extra B zeros, and we're not wasting our time doing a lot of extra work that we shouldn't be doing. All right, now let's make this do something a little bit more interesting here. I can learn how to type. Okay, so what I do here, I've folded in the modifications in the last program and removed the old stuff, and I got rid of my const that was unnecessary in there, okay? So in this program, we've got the same safe write we had before. Let's look down here at how we're calling it. After we do a safe write, I added this one line down here. It says print response, and I give that subroutine, a, a, the, a, the uh, socket file descriptor down here, okay? So up here in the print response function, which is right here, what we're gonna do is, we're, as the doc says, we're gonna read data uh, from the given socket file descriptor, which is this argument down here, until we reach the end of file, okay? So what is this program then gonna do, assuming this does what it says? We'll look at how it works in a minute. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna send a bunch of data over to the server, and when we're done with that, we're going to do exactly what the subroutine name implies, and that is we're going to read a response message back from the server, and we're going to print that out. All right. So in this application, what's going to happen is we're going to send data from the client to the server. Then the server is going to send data back. So we're going to, this is the kind of thing you do if you're running a server request response kind of a thing. Like when we use Netcat to connect over to Google and we asked it, hey, what, show me the heading for your homepage uh, in a web page. And it, we, we sent data out to Google. Google responded back with a response. All right. So that's what this, the mechanics of this application is going to work just like that. So what are we going to do? We're going to create a buffer. I'm going to prime my while loop because I tend to like top-driven while loops rather than bottom-driven ones like in the IPC tutorial. But this is the same, essentially the same thing. It's going to go into an endless loop until this read value that comes back will return a zero, which represents the end of file. And the end of file, remember, when we're dealing with a socket, means that the peer, that is the other end of the connection, closed it. Okay, so while there's something to read in the other end, the peer has not yet closed it. I'm going to just do what we just looked at happened on the server a minute ago. I'm going to read in from the socket into my buffer here for up to size of buff minus one. Okay, and it all collapse into one big statement. We can say, you know, if read returned a negative one, we know we got an error. So print out our little error message and return one back to the caller so that it knows that something bad happened. We're not going to process it in this particular application. We're going to just ignore that error and go on and exit the program. But when you're going to write a function like this, you probably want to let the caller know if something bad happened, right? If uh, what? If it returned a value that's greater than zero, that means we did not get an end of file condition. We're going to zero terminate our buffer like we should have right <laughs> 35 years ago right and then uh, we're going to print out the same kind of message we did on the server say i got this many bytes and these are the bytes with the angle brackets so we can kind of see what's going on in case there's any spaces hiding in there to confuse us when we're done with this we're going to return a zero to let the caller know that everything was fine right and of course this is going to go in a loop because if this if the read call 
gives us less than everything that's out there, okay, we got to go back and keep going. Get more printed out, get more printed out until the server closes the socket. This will just go around in a loop forever. When this is done, we close the socket and exit the whole program. And to be technically correct, we should return something from our main because the main is supposed to return an integer, okay? And let's compile it up. Now, remember our server, the server that we just ran last time, we ran server number three, all right? Let's take a close look at uh, that program and, and make sure that we understand what would happen if I connect client four back to server three. All right, so in server three, the way this works is that it goes into this loop. It reads from the socket forever until it gets to an end of file condition down here, which causes the loop to terminate and close the socket and go back and wait for a new connection from another client. If we connected our new client to this server, what will happen is the new client will send a bunch of data over, and this will print it out. And when it stops sending data to this server, the server will just sit here waiting for more data. And this will deadlock. All right, let's go ahead and demonstrate that. By running the server 3 again, and connect to it with our new client four. And it does exactly that. You can see that the client is sitting here. It sent out its data bytes and it's waiting for a response. But the server, as we just saw, entered its main loop and it's reading. It gets the first 1023 and it prints it out. It goes back for more. It gets the other part of the data that the client sent and it goes back to the top of its loop. And now we're sitting here stuck. And we're stuck because the client did not close the socket. And we didn't provide any other way for the server to figure out that there's no more data right now. Like for example, if we really wanted to, maybe the client could have sent some value to the server. Like maybe it could send a null, a null byte. Because if the idea is to send a bunch of text that the server prints out, sending it a null or some other control code that doesn't print would be a perfectly reasonable and delimiter type of a thing to let the server know, hey, if you ever get one of these, stop reading and then start uh, you know, processing or responding back to the client. All right, So that's one way to do it. Now, as we'll see, there's also another way to do it that might be a little bit easier. Now let's look at server four here. What did I do in here? So I added some code. What I did here, as I said, read until I get end of file and print like we usually do, and then send some stuff back to the client, like thank you very much, and it prints it back out. Now every time I send something back to the client, I print out you know how many bytes I sent. Because technically, if I want to do this, I should have a safe write function in here in the server as well, right? This is just foolishness, okay? You, if you were going to do this, you can't do it this way. I'm going to do it this way and cheat because if I only get part of it sent, that's okay. For a demonstration, it'll be fine. But if you need to know that all the data that you wrote actually got there, you can't do it this way. You must write another safe write function. I should copy that from the client app into the server and use it. Okay, now let's run this one instead of server three and see what happens here. Now I got client four and I got server four and we run it and again it gets stuck. And why is it stuck? Because the server still is trying to read until it receives an end of file which occurs when the client down here closes its end of the socket, which will happen if I hit control C. Okay. Now look what happened up in the server. Something kind of subtle happened when I killed the client.
The server says ending connection. It prints out that it wrote a 12-byte message over to the client, which clearly didn't get it because I hit control C and I killed the client. But even more interesting, I got my prompt back. Why do I have a command prompt back when, if we look at the server four code over here, when it gets done and it receives the end of file, it's going to write some stuff out. And we saw it wrote, it, it, it printed this out and it said it printed the 12 bytes, right? Well, there's the 12 bytes. It never printed this out down here. And it never got to the bottom of this while loop. And this is the important thing. Why did this while loop not go back around to the top up here and accept another connection? For all intents and purposes, this is the same server that we've been running all day, except it simply prints some stuff down here when this loop here ends. Now, the, the loop up here doesn't end because of some other problems that we're going to fix as we talk about some new stuff in a second. But along our way, we have another problem. Well, remember in the IPC tutorial, it said if you ever write data to a socket after it's been closed, your process will receive an error of type SIGPIPE. And if you have a signal that you don't handle, and this does not handle any signals because we didn't put any code in there to handle them, this program will die. All right, this actually terminated and we got our system prompt back over here because after we wrote the first 12 bytes to the client when the client was gone, we tried to write more data. And these two write operations failed, which generated a termination signal to this process, and this process died, okay? Like I said, this is kind of subtle, but we should have never gotten that command prompt back. But we did because the way this server is written right now, it has two problems. One, it can never get out of its read loop without getting an end of file. And if it does get an end of file, it should not write into that socket because if it does, it's going to get a SIG pipe and it's going to get terminated. Okay? There is a problem with the client which is similar, all right? These are complementary problems. In that the client here writes data to the server and it insists that the server send data back, but the server doesn't know that the client has finished writing. Okay? Now this is a very common problem and there is a simple way to solve it. And that is right here in the client after you write your data to the server you can close half of the socket okay there's a command that says let the server know that I'm not writing any more data and I will do that by what we call half closing the socket I'm gonna close the data pipe that goes from the client to the server while leaving open the data pipe that goes from the server back to the client. Okay? And that's what we're going to see in client 5. This command right here. Shut down. All right? So the only difference between client 4 and client 5 is this call to shut down right here on this socket, which is the one that we're using for all of our communication with the server, okay? And this right here says shut down the right side, the right pipe. You can think about it, it has two pipes, one that goes from the client to the server. That's the writing pipe from the perspective of the client, okay? And then the pipe that goes from the server back to the client, from the client's perspective, that would be the reading pipe, okay? So now what's gonna happen is I'm gonna write data over to the server, I'm gonna close half of the socket down, and the server is gonna say, aha, 
the client just closed the right side of its end of this connection, and it'll show up on the server as the read side of the pipe has been closed. Its read loop will then terminate, fall down, and send the response data back to the client, at which point the client will be sitting down here waiting for and printing out that response. So this is how we solve this problem. Let's compile that up and run that one. So if we run the server 4 as it was, okay, and this time we run the client number 5 with the half shutdown in there, it should work fine, and it does. You can see that on the server it received two big blocks of data, which is all the text it sent over. There's the first one, there's the beginning of the second one. Second one ends right there. It says, okay, I'm ending the connection. Then it says it's writing 12 bytes, and it says it's writing nine bytes, okay? The client sends out its data, and it gets two response messages. Thanks, thank you very much, all right? And these are the two write commands at the bottom of the server four program. And we didn't get our prompt back, so if I do this again, it'll run again, and again, and again, and again, all right? It <laughs> does the exact same thing, so you don't even see it scroll, all right? And the server will die when I hit Control-C. So this now works much more like we would expect it to. Now, let's look at some other potential problems here. Now, this does exactly what we want it to do. But what if something takes place in here that takes a long time after the client shuts down this socket before the response data goes back? I mean, if you think about it, machines run, you know, if there's a lot of programs on here going or I'm playing a video game or something like that, I could be using all the CPU and it can cause this program to slow down and cause a variable length amount of time to pass between the point in time when this loop finishes and this code down here runs, okay? So you can simulate that by putting just a massive amount of delay in here. A one second delay is enormous in a program, okay? Now let's run that and see what happens. One one thousand. You see, it hesitated in there before the response came back. Now this program works fine. It just takes a lot longer for the response to come back after the client sends the data over to the server. Again, one one thousand, and then pow, it hesitates in response. All right, that's pretty cool. But what happens if you then run a program like, for example? like client three. What happens if a client program sends data to the server and then the client closes the socket? Well, we actually saw that once before. If you do that, and the server receives a bunch of data here, it notices that the read side of the socket has been closed. Now remember that the client three closes the whole socket and exits at that point in time. If by the time we get down here, the socket's already closed, like you saw before, this is gonna die while writing and it's gonna get a SIG pipe and this process was gonna terminate. That's gonna be a serious problem if this server is supposed to run 24 seven and handle like bank transactions for all your customers. Okay, in other words, you need to take care of that problem because you can never trust an application that you didn't write. And even if you did write it, I mean, I wrote these and they don't work. I made errors on purpose, but even while debugging these, I made mistakes and they'll crash. All right. So how do we make sure that our server doesn't have a problem if the client decides to close its socket before we finish writing? Because the rule is, if you write to a socket that's been closed, you get what's called a sig, a sig pipe, a signal because a pipe has been closed, what we call a broken pipe, okay? Let's read the man page for the signal function, all right? There's a function called signal. You can give it a number, and you tell it what to do if that signal arrives. 
Down here it says the behavior signal varies and you get all this weird crazy stuff. But, but if you use this thing to set the signal number for the broken pipe equal to ignore, then the server process will not be killed if it ever tries to write into a closed socket. In which case, we can just send the data, even though the client's gone. The data will be thrown away by the operating system and make our lives real easy. You just simply write. Who cares if it's thrown away? Client's gone. There's nothing you can do about it if the client died and closed the socket. There really is nothing you can do. So you might as well just ignore that error. And there's a way to do that, all right? So we're going to use the signal function. We need to look up whatever number is for the SIG pipe, all right? And we set the handler to this thing over here. So let's look down in here. Uh, it'll probably say, see this, that, and every other darn thing to figure out where all the signal names are defined. Yikes. So where are they defined? They're probably in, now they talk specifically about a couple of them. SIG kill, SIG FPE, that's like a floating point exception. So you divide by zero, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, where is the SIG pipe defined? So if you go to the bottom of the manual page, it says see also all these here, okay? You can go through these all one at a time, hoping you'll find the list of the signal types that you can deal with. And lucky for you, it'll be the very last one in their list, okay? Now, notice we typed man signal, and that's the page we're looking at right now. This one has a 7 over here next to it, all right? We're looking at section 2 of the manual, the system call for signal, all right? That's what section 2 has in it. Notice this one has section 7 over there. To read the section 7 entry for signal... You type man seven signal. Now you look inside here, it says, okay, here's the overview of how all the signals work and what they all mean and what their names are. And they're going to be down here. Blah, 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 blah. The one you care about is sig pipe. There it is. It'll say a broken pipe right to a pipe with no reader. That's exactly what our problem is. This term over here, okay, that column says, what does it do by default? Well, if we don't tell it to do something otherwise, if we ever get a SIG pipe, it will terminate our program, okay? That's why the program's dying, all right? So let's go ahead and do a SIG pipe and ignore it in our server. All right, so here's server 5, which is right now a copy of server 4. What I'm going to do at the top of this program, now remember, uh, signals are something that affect the process as a whole. This has nothing to do with, like, you, you set the signal handler for a socket or something like that. No, 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 no. This is for the process. So what you're going to do is type signal, and then you're going to say uh, sig pipe. And what, what did it say? Sig DFL, I believe. And we compile it up, and we have a nice error because I forgot to include the proper header file. If you're going to call the signal uh, system call, you have to pound include signal.h, and that comes from the manual page for signal right here. It said up there, I just simply forgot to do it, all right? So if you want to call signal, you have to include this header file right there, all right? Let's compile it again. Now it works. Let's run it and see what happens here. That's uh, signal 5, right? There we go, and let's run our client 5, okay? And it works, and it lets me reconnect. And of course, it's working correctly all along, right? The one that failed was when we ran client 3 up here. We ran 5 a lot of times, didn't we? Let's rerun client 3, because remember, client 3 sends data to the server, then close the socket and, abri uh, and abruptly exits right away, okay? So now what's going to happen? We run client 3, look what happens in the server. It simply goes, 
we see that it died again. <laughs> you know why? Because I can't code and talk at the same time. What did I do wrong? I said, set it to the default handler <laughs> when we wrote the signal code in here. That is wrong. That's what it did all along. We want the signal ignore, right? Jeez. Right? Oops, I want to say man signal. Boy, I cannot code and talk at the same time tonight. All right, so ignore, not default, okay? So let's go ahead and recompile that. Come down here and rerun it, server 5. Let's rerun our client 3 to make sure it, client 3 will cause the server to have an error, but it should not die, okay? And notice what happened here. It wrote 12 bytes and thought it got away with it. Then it called it the second time, and negative 1 means there was an error of some kind while writing, okay? And it ignored that error, went back to the top of its loop, and allows us to connect again, all right? So now we run client 3 repeatedly. Our server is not going to crash just because we wrote a bad client. And if we write the correct client, like client 5, it'll do the right thing. All right, so now we have a bit more of a robust server. Of course, it'd be nice if we don't wait an entire second for no reason while handling a transaction. But I put that in there to make sure that we had a, a, a timing case where we knew that the client would have exited right away so that the server would have a chance to know that the socket had been closed before it got down to where it wrote. Okay, now we can come at this back out again, and it'll be luck of the draw, because it might actually sneak all this in before it ever even finds out, before the client here has a chance to even close the socket, right? I mean, sometimes that can happen. This will be an inconsistent um, kind of a situation. Let's see what happens. If we run client 5, it should work fine. Because it were because client five is, five is behaving itself. If we now run client three, client three will misbehave. What happens there? Well, even if it doesn't wait at all in the server, it still fails in that second write call down there. Okay. Now, if we want to, we can go ahead and write out that p error. Right. I mean, we've been doing it everywhere else. Okay. What we really, really, really should do is write a correct safe write routine in the server like I did in the client. But I'm going to leave that as a task for the student. Okay. So what am I going to do here? I'm going to write an if here, and I'm going to say if our val is less than zero, I'm going to do the p error. I'm going to just say write failed. Okay, and I'm going to copy it, and I'm going to paste that same thing down here. I should have done both lines, but whatever. Okay, now when it failed, it'll get it'll show you what this p error thing is going to do. Okay, now it'll actually probably say broken pipe when we run the client three here, which is exactly what it did. Right, failed, broken pipe. Okay, and if we run the client five, which is the program that's supposed to work correctly, we see it working properly. All right. So, armed with just this, you should be able to write a client and a server and make sure that your server doesn't die if it's writing to a pipe that the client has gone away or closed it or something like that. You can also write a client and a server that uses a half-closed uh, connection like we saw in Client 5 over here a few minutes ago by using this shutdown, okay? So this technique is very common. It's what you use on your client and your server to implement a request response type of a server, okay? And of course, the server has to deal with the ignoring of the SIG pipe so that if the client misbehaves or crashes, you know, maybe it does a right here and then it crashes right here, and when it crashes, the operating system will have closed the socket over to the server, and the server would not realize that that had happened because it's an unrelated process, and it tries to write back into its pipe. Again, you really want to make sure your server doesn't crash because one client misbehaves, right? So, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.